In section 3.1, we're going to calculate the formula masses for different compounds. And then we're going to talk about what a mole is and how that relates to Avogadro's. The first formula mass. The formula mass of substance is the sum of the average atomic masses of all the atoms in the substance's formula. So we take our uh, molecule here for our compound, okay? We look up the masses in the periodic table, and we multiply by how many of these different atoms we have, and then we add them all together and we get the mass of that entire unit. So in this case, we have one carbon, one, two, three chlorines, and one hydrogen, okay? So we multiply carbon by one, we multiply hydrogen by one, we multiply the chlorine by three, we get these values in AMU, if we add them together, we see that we wind up with 119.37 AMU for our chloroform molecule. Here are a couple more examples. We can see that it can get pretty complicated, but the formula is always the same. We count up our number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens in this case, we multiply them by how many we have. Look up their atomic masses, we add them together, and we get a molecular mass. Okay. It is important to note that the term molecular mass only applies to covalent compounds, covalently bonded compounds, whereas formula mass is the exact same value, but that applies to both ionic and covalent formed things. And the reason for that is, is because ionic substances substances they're not discrete molecules okay they are cations and anions that are being combined in specific ratios to create uh, a pattern like a, a lattice structure that's going to make up the bulk that we uh, uh, material that we see in our world in the microscopic level okay so let's look at an example so you can see what i mean so here we have sodium chloride. This is packed in this cubic sort of structure. Um, so you could imagine this cube going on and on in every single direction to make up the sodium chloride that you see at your table. But the smallest repeating unit is always one sodium atom and one chlorine atom combined together. So our formula mass for sodium chloride is just going to be that one sodium and that one chlorine. We'll multiply those by their average atomic mass, add them together, and we get 58.44. It doesn't always have to be so clean. Here you can see aluminum sulfate has a very complex structure, but still there is a base repeating unit, certain proportion of the elements. And if you go to that proportion, you'll see that there's two aluminums for every three sulfurs, for every 12 oxygens, okay? We multiply them by their atomic masses together. 342.14 AM. The mole. So the mole is an amount unit, similar to how a pair means two, or a dozen means 12, or a gross is 144. The mole is just a number of things. Okay? And what that number is defined as is the number of atoms that are contained within a 12 gram sample of pure carbon 12. Seems like a little bit of a weird definition, but we'll see later why that uh, behooves us to, to define it that way. Um, the question is how much is a mole? A mole is a lot of things, okay? It is 6.022141719 times 10 to the 23rd things, okay? A whole bunch of them. This number is known as Avogadro's number. You'll see it abbreviated with a capital N and a little a. And usually we just do, um, truncate it to be 6.022 into the 23rd. Um, why is this useful? Well, first let's take a look at the moles of different things. So if we look here, you can see that each one of these contains a mole of atoms. 
each one of them weighs a different amount. That's because each individual atom weighs a different amount. Okay, But we can figure out how many atoms are in each one of these samples simply by weighing them um, because we have to find the mole weight. The molar mass of an element. So this is where our definition really helps us a lot. Okay, but it's a little tricky to figure out. The molar mass of an element is the mass in grams of one mole of that substance, a property expressed in units of grams per mole. So now we have a molar mass, units of grams per mole. We can interrelate mass and moles. This value is numerically equivalent, it is the same number. As the atomic or formula mass of the uh, an AMU. So a single carbon 12 atom has a mass of 12 AMU, but a mole of those atoms has a mass of 12 grams. Okay, we can inter convert between AMU and grams per mole. They are the same number. Just pick whatever unit we want to put on that number. It's convenient for the calculation that we're going to do. Here's another example of some moles of stuff. You can see that sometimes it's quite a bit if we have a very light um, or a very heavy compound. All right, here you can just see a table that illustrates what I'm talking about. So carbon is 12.01 AMU, but also 12.01 grams for every mole. How many atoms are in that mole? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. These values are going to be different for each one of the elements. They'll be different for each of the compounds. So let's do some calculations that are going to relate the mass of moles in Avogadro's number. Take a look at these. All right, so according to nutritional guidelines from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Estimated average requirement for dietary potassium is 4.7 grams. You're supposed to get 4.7 grams of um, potassium. What is the estimated average requirement of potassium in moles? So how many moles are in that 4.7 grams? So we start off with 4.7 grams from the problem. Okay. We need to if we go and look up potassium in the periodic table, we see that that is 39.1 AMU. We know that AMUs are the same as grams per mole. How do we use that conversion factor? Well, we think about what our units there are that we want. Have grams. So I need to put grams into the denominator here so that it cancels. That leaves it one mole in the numerator. And I see that it's 0.12 moles of potassium. Get a little bit let's go from moles back to mass okay so a liter of air contains 9.2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of argon what is the mass of argon in a liter of air so this time i'm starting off with moles i need to put that one mole in the denominator here i look up the atomic mass of argon i see that that's 39.95 i put that up here in grams Cancel my moles and I see that that many moles of argon weighs 0 0.037 grams. Okay, so when you're going to the number of atoms, you may be tempted to try and go straight from mass to the number of atoms. We think that that's possible. It is not. You have to do this in two steps. First, um, converting the mass to moles and then converting those moles to the number of atoms. And we can kind of string those together. We don't actually have to calculate the number of moles and uh, have a value for that. We can put them all together in order to get the atoms of carbon. So we start off with the 24 grams of copper in our problem up here. We divide that by the atomic mass of copper that we looked up, okay. So we're using the molar mass here. 63.546 grams of copper for every one mole. Now I have units of moles. 
Now I multiply that by the other conversion factor we have. We know that there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of copper in every mole of copper that I have. Okay, canceling my moles here, and I see that that sample of copper is 2.27 times 10 to the 23rd copper. All right, how many moles are there in a 28.35 gram sample of glycine? Okay, so in this case, before we had just elements, single atoms, now we actually have to figure out the formula mass of glycine first before we can figure out how many moles there are. Let's, we're combining two things together. So here's our glycine. There are two carbons, five hydrogens, two oxygens, and one nitrogen. We multiply each one of those by a molar mass here. Again, we're looking those up in the periodic table. We get values for each one. We add them together. We see that one mole of glycine weighs 75.07 grams. Take the amount of glycine we had from the problem. We divide that by that 75.07 grams. We get moles up here in the numerator. We get that mass of glycine, 0.378 moles. Okay. Let's make this even a little bit more complicated. This time we have a packet of artificial sweetener. It contains 40 milligrams of saccharin, which has the structural formula. You can see it there. Given that saccharin has a molar mass of 183.18 grams per mole, how many saccharin molecules are in a 40 milligram sample? Or 40 milligram sample? So that's pretty straightforward. The second question is, how many carbon atoms are in that same sample? So first we need to figure out how many atoms, of, how many of these guys we have in that 40 milligram sample, and then we need to figure out how many carbon atoms that is. We can see that there are seven carbon atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and for every one of these. So we're going to have to multiply the number of atoms of saccharin by 7 to get the number of carbon atoms. Go through that. So the first step we're going to have to do is we're going to need to convert that 40 milligrams over to grams so that we have the same units between our molar mass and here so we can cancel these grams. Okay, so 40 milligrams is 0.04 grams. Start there. We divide that by our molar mass. We now have units of moles. But we need to know how many molecules there are. We know that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules for every one mole. We multiply by that. We know that there are 1.31 times 10 to the 20th saccharin molecule. We counted up earlier that there were seven carbon atoms for every one of those saccharin molecules. So we'll multiply that value by seven. We get 9.17 times 10 to the 20th carbon atom. Section 3.2 learning objectives. We're going to compute the percent composition of a compound, and we're going to determine the empirical formula of a compound, and then we're going to talk about the difference between an empirical formula and the molecular. Okay. Percent composition. The percent composition is not that difficult, really. Um, basically, you're going to take the mass, in this case, of each. Uh, different piece of the compound, okay, um, and you're going to divide that by the total mass of that. I have a 10 gram sample, 2.5 grams of it is hydrogen, 7.5 grams of it is carbon, then I know 7.5 plus 2.5 is 10, so this whole sample is either hydrogen or carbon. Um, I can figure out the percent of it that is hydrogen by mass, so 2.5 grams. Divide it by the entirety of the mass of the entire compound. Multiply that by 100%. I get 25% of it is hydrogen. In this case, if I have 7.5 grams of carbon, divide that by the total mass. Multiply that by 100%. I get 75% of it is carbon. 25% plus 75% is 100%. So I now know the entire percent composition of this compound. 
it doesn't actually have to be masked. Okay, the thing that you have to realize is that it could also be the formula mass units. Okay, it doesn't have to just be grams. Um, in this case, if we have ammonia, then we know that ammonia has a formula mass of 17.03 AMU. Okay, the atomic mass of nitrogen is 14.01 AMU. I divide that by the formula mass of the entire compound, multiply that by 100%, I see that on a mass basis, ammonia is 82.27% nitrogen. Over here, I have hydrogen. I have to realize that there are three of these, right? So I do three times the atomic mass of hydrogen. I divide that by the total mass of ammonia. And I multiply that by 100%, I get 17.76%. Now, since we've covered every element that's in this compound, these two should add to give me 100%. And if you do the math there, you'll see it comes out pretty close, right? A little bit of wiggle room there, but that is mostly due to the fact that these are average here that we haven't used quite enough decimal places to make it perfect. Uh, so, empirical formula. A compound's empirical formula can be determined from the masses of its constituent elements. So we have three steps. First, we'll convert the element masses to moles. Then we divide each number of moles by the smallest number of moles. And then, if necessary, we will multiply by an integer to get whole values. So let's take a look at an example on our flow chart. So we start off with some masses. There could be many of these, but if in this case we just have two, we'll divide them both by the molar masses. Now we have a set of moles. We divide by the lowest number of moles. Okay, so that means that one of these is going to wind up to be one in this scenario because we're going to divide it by itself. I'll show you an example in a moment. We get a mole ratio, and then we're going to convert that to whole values. We might wind up with fractions. Compound is determined to contain 1.71 grams of carbon and 0.383 grams of hydrogen. First step here, we're going to convert. Uh, mass of carbon to the moles of carbon and the mass of hydrogen to the moles of hydrogen we did before. Now if we just took these values and used them as the subscript or formula, you can see that that's pretty silly. You can't have fractions of carbon atoms or fractions of hydrogen. We need these to be whole values. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the smallest of these values and we're going to divide both of them by that. Do that, we wind up dividing this by itself, so we're going to get 1. And when we divide this one, we get 3.9. And this is where students get a little confused. We're not going to get too hung up on the fact that this isn't perfectly 4. We're just going to use an approximation and we're going to call it 4. Really don't need to worry about that unless you get to something like 3.5 or something like that. And we'll see an example of that. Um, so sometimes we're going to go through the steps and we're not really going to get whole values. In so start off in this example with um, the masses of chlorine and the masses of oxygen contained in a sample. We divide them by their uh, molecular, by their atomic masses. We're going to get these mole values. We place them to our formula, do our division by the smallest value, and we wind up getting something that's like seven and a half. So pretty much 3.5 here. We really don't know whether to round that up or down. So what we do in that case is we just multiply both values by whatever is going to clear our fraction. So in this case, if we multiply them both by two, 
get 1 times 2, that there was a applied 1 here, okay, because 1 point, 0.15 divided by 0.15 is 1. 1 times 2 here, 7.5 times 2, see that we can here perform CO2, 7. Um, so by adding one additional step, we can get the empirical formula from the percent composition. And basically what we're going to assume is that we have a 100 gram sample in order to get the masses that we need to start with to determine our empirical formula. So let's look at an example of that. In this example, the bacterial fermentation of grain to produce ethanol forms a gas with a percent composition of 27.29% carbon and 72.71% oxygen. What is the empirical formula for this gas? So we're going to start off by assuming that we have 100 grams of gas. It actually doesn't matter how much we assume there is of the gas, but 100 grams is very convenient. Okay. So if we have 100 grams of gas, 27.29% of it is carbon, that we get 27.29 grams of carbon in the gas. Similarly for the oxygen, you wind up with 72.71 grams of oxygen. From this point, figuring out the empirical formula is exactly like the steps we saw before. We'll figure out the moles of carbon and oxygen. We'll place them into our formula. We'll divide by the smallest value. This time it works out almost perfectly the carbon dioxide. Um, so the molecular formula, the empirical formula, is not necessarily representative of a molecule. It is going to represent the smallest repeating unit in that molecule. So when you have a complex molecule that doesn't repeat itself, the molecular formula will be the empirical formula, but sometimes you need to multiply by a value in order to get from the empirical formula to the molecular formula when there's a high level of symmetry in that molecular compound. Let me show you what I mean by that. So in this example, we know that a compound is an empirical formula of CH2O. The empirical formula mass is 30 AMU. But we know that the molecular mass of this compound is actually 100. So if I take that 180 AMU, divide it by the 30 AMU, I get that there are six formula units per molecule. So then what I can do is I can go through and get used to this um, representation here. You see these parentheses here with the six out in front. I'm going to multiply each one of the subscripts by that 6. Get C6, H12, O6, which is the basic um, formula for any kind of sugar. Monosaccharide. And I know that the molecular formula for this compound is C6, H12, O6. Section 3.3, we're going to describe the fundamental properties of what a solution is. We're going to calculate some solution concentrations using molarity. We'll learn what molarity is. And then we'll figure out how to perform the calculations to do dilution. <clears throat> um, so, for, so far, we've been dealing with pure substances. But in fact, most of the world is actually made of mixtures, things mixing together. Here's an example of a mixture with coffee and sugar. Coffee is already a mixture of water and uh, coffee grounds. And it has been extracted from that. We add sugar in there and it dissolve. It will become part of the mixture, form a solution. Solutions are when these mixtures are homogeneous. So every point, every little bit that you would pick out of this solution going to have the same uniform composition as every other bit. And this is what chemists like. Okay, If I go to take a sample of some liquid out of a container, I don't want to be thinking, is this, exact, is this different than some other bit of that same container? I want the entire thing to be homogeneous and the same throughout. 
if I know what I'm getting every time I take a sample. Mixtures solutions are everywhere. Distilled white vinegar, um, for instance, is only 5% acetic acid, whereas the rest of it is actually water. So solutions consist of two components. You have your solvent. The solvent is, is the component that is in higher concentration. So there's more solvent than there is anything else. Now, in our example before, the solvent is going to be your water. Then you have your solute. This is the component that is present at much lower concentrations than the solvent. In a previous example, the solute would be the acetic acid. Um, and when we have a solution where the solvent is water, we often call this an aqueous solution. See that later. So molarity. Um, so this is probably the unit that's most used in chemistry. And the reason for that being, we often want to know how many moles we're delivering, how many moles we're mixing with something else. And I want to be able to do that by measuring out specific volumes. Okay. So we need a unit that's going to relate the moles to the volume, and that's exactly what malaria is. So malaria is defined as the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. So that's solution being the solute solvent um, combination, not say the liters of solvent. But solution. Here's our example. A 355 milliliter soft drink sample contains 0.133 moles of sucrose, that's sugar. What is the molar concentration of sucrose in the beverage? So, given moles, I'm going to put the moles in the numerator, and I need to, my solution here is the soft drink. I need that in liters. I'll have to make a conversion down here. And what I wind up getting is that this is a 0.375 molar solution of uh, sugar in our soft drink. So dilution is the typical way that chemists are going to um, prepare different solutions, solutions of different concentrations. Um, it's not only convenient, but it has some other benefits that I'm discussing a little bit more. Um, but typically, what happens is you have a concentrated stock solution, carefully prepared, so exactly its concentration, um, and you can dilute down from that to get specific concentrations. So, how do we handle the math to know how much of this sample to take out? And what to dilute it up to to get specific. The way we're going to do that is we start off with the definition of moles from this concentration. So if molarity is moles per liter, if I take molarity and multiply it by the volume in liters, I'm going to get moles. But when you dilute something, so this is moles of the solute. So when you dilute something, though, you didn't change the solute concentration. You didn't change the number of moles of solute. You only changed the number of moles of solvent. Okay? So that means that the number of moles of solute initially in our stock concentration is going to be the concentration of that uh, stock solution times the volume that we have of it, that we took from it. And the number of moles uh, that we're going to wind up with in our diluted sample is going to be the concentration of that diluted sample times its volume, the volume that we diluted to. Okay? So these two equal each other. And if we set them equal to each other, we see that, the, that what we wind up with is that the initial concentration of our stock solution multiplied by the volume that we withdrew from that stock solution to dilute is going to be equal to the concentration of our diluted solution we make multiplied by the volume how much of that solution we make. Okay? 
this can actually be extended to um, other concentration units. So it's in general true you think that, that you can do this with any concentration unit. We'll talk about some of the other ones later. But C1, V1 is always going to equal C2. Let's go through an example. So we start off with 0 0.850 liters of our 5 molar copper nitrate solution. We take that amount of this copper nitrate solution and we dilute that up to 1.8. Okay. What is the molarity of the diluted solution? So C1 in this case is our initial concentration, 5 molar, 5.00 molar. V1 is how much of that we withdrew, it's going to be our 0 0.850 liters. C2 is what they're asking us for. This is the concentration of the diluted solution. And V2 is the volume that we diluted up to. It's going to be our 1.80 liters. Solving for C2, we get this expression here. Plugging in our values, we wind up with this here. You can see that liters are going to cancel, and we're going to have units of molarity in the end. This number, 2.36, is less than our stock solution, which makes sense. The concentration must always go down for diluted. So in section 3.4, we're going to talk about some other concentration units. The first one is going to be mass percent. Um, you'll see this a lot on a lot of consumer items because it's very convenient to weigh the solutes and the resulting solution. And so our mass percent is going to be the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100%. You see that we typically are going to write this with the percent symbol followed by mass to indicate that this particular percentage is based on mass. Here's an example of where you're going to see that. Most household bleaches have an active ingredient of sodium hypochlorite, and that bleach is going to be between 5 and 10 percent sodium hypochlorite by mass. The next one is very similar, only this time we're going to do it by volume. So you might measure out the volume of a solute and divide that by the volume of the solution. Multiply that by 100% and get your percent by volume. The last one um, is one that I typically don't like to use because we're actually mixing different units here. You can see here that we had, uh, we can match these units and wind up with a unitless value. Multiplying that by 100% makes it a true percentage. But that's not true for mass volume. So here we're going to have different units. And so it's very important that when you look and recognize mass volume, that you always look for this percent mass divided by volume m divided by v and typically what this is going to indicate because there's no other units given is you're going to think okay if it's 0.9 percent mass by volume that means that there's 0.9 grams of solute for every 100 milliliter of solution so 0.9 percent m over v is going to be 0.9 grams per 100 mil. You will see these mass volume uh, values out there quite a bit. Um, probably the most common way that I see it is um, when they're talking about various blood levels. Um, very, very common to see this milligrams per deciliter value. Um, PPM and PPD will make sense sometimes. These are pretty much the same as uh, percent by mass, only in this case, instead of multiplying by 100%, we're going to multiply by 10 to the 6 or a million for PPM, and we're going to multiply by 10 to the 9 or a billion for PPD. Um, the reason that we do this is because these values are 
very, 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 very small. And we don't want to, we want to represent them in a way that is convenient, that we, so we don't have to write numbers small. Um, so we just come up with a very, very small unit. When do we use PPM and PPD? Uh, you'll see it a lot with um, water samples or with air samples. Anywhere where a very small amount of PPM may have a very large effect. 